Welcome to our November TMIT National Research Testbed High Performer Webinar Series. Uh, this is Chuck Denham. Uh, I am the chair of TMIT and am really honored to have a terrific uh, group of speakers and reactors for us today. What I'd like to do is just remind everyone who are new to our webinar uh, and uh, those of you that have been with us to just make sure to turn your volume up as high as you can on your computer to make sure that your audio quality is satisfactory. And if for any reason you do not have good audio, go to the lower uh, left uh, quadrant of your screen and click on the telephone icon and that will help you uh, and will help you with a direct line. I'm on slide four of the slide deck if you don't have them yet, and those of you that have them, uh, on our landing page of safetyleaders.org, uh, you'll find in the upper right-hand uh, corner of the landing page an opportunity to click on that. Uh, and if you click on the, the upcoming events, you'll find today's webinar, and you'll be able to click down on that to be able to uh, uh, get access to the, the slides and an audio recording in the future. Uh, I'm, uh, and that is safetyleaders.org. And then on slide six, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook uh, as well. And slide seven, uh, our calling at TMIT is to save lives, save money, and create value in the communities we serve. Everything we try to focus on does those three simultaneously. It's really held us, uh, uh, held our, uh, our feet on the road, on the, on the, on the proper road uh, for 30 years. And so we always want to emphasize that we're trying to do those three things simultaneously. Our disclosure statement I will not read. However, there are full disclosures and up-to-date disclosure statements uh, on slide eight. On slide nine, would like to remind you that uh, no funder or educational grantor has had any influence on the content. We have no financial relationships with the speakers nor the books that will be uh, recommended. Um, and no pharmaceutical device uh, or device will be uh, uh, covered in the webinar. So now that we've uh, covered some of the Housekeeping details. I'd like to turn to one of the, my favorite people on the planet, Jennifer Dingman, who is a often, uh, oftentimes uh, Jennifer steps up for us to give us inspirational statements at the beginning of our webinars. She's been a steadfast supporter of patient safety, a real safety champion. Every other Saturday morning, she and a, and a group who have lost family members get together with us and work with us. She has been uh, a co-author of multiple papers in the Journal of Patient Safety. She's also been uh, one of the authors of the chapter in the NQFSA practices co-authored with Dennis Quaid and other leaders. Uh, and she also serves now helping as a patient advocate and champion for groups such as the uh, HRSA in the, in the federal government. Jennifer, would you give us uh, 30 seconds of, get, uh, of thoughts that can get us grounded on what we are to do today? Thank you so much, Dr. Denham. I just want to welcome everybody here today who is here at this webinar. And I just want to thank our presenters and um, want you to know on behalf of many, many patients and families throughout the United States, how grateful we all are to all of you for being here today and learning more and more from Dr. Denham and his webinars. Thank you again. And Dr. Denham, I'll hand it back over to you. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jenny. So we have uh, a, a wonderful group of speakers uh, and panelists today. We uh, have uh, Dr. Greg Boats, who I'll introduce uh, in a moment, from MD Anderson, uh, who is Professor of Anesthesiology and Critical Care there and the Medical Director of the Transfer Acute uh, Care Training Center and Medical Emergency Rapid uh, Intervention Team. We have Dr. Don Kennerly, uh, well known to us from uh, uh, Baylor in Dallas. Uh, Dr. Kennerly is the Chief Quality Officer of the Baylor Health Healthcare System. And I've known Dr. Kennerly for a number of years and has been just a terrific, a steadfast supporter of uh, and leader in patient safety and quality along with the team in, uh, in Baylor. Uh, Jennifer Dingman, who you've heard from, and Frank Guiato, uh, our Chief Technology Officer at, uh, at TMIT. So what I'd like to do is just take a few minutes, just a few minutes, to kind of uh, update you on uh, the, the safety ecosystem and some things that are happening uh, right now that we want to be cognizant of as we move forward and look at our December webinar and those in 2014. Slide 13 addresses the second curve, what we call the accountable care curve. 
And as we move from the current fee-for-service curve uh, of reimbursement of small transactions that are really driven by volume to the accountable care curve where we're treating populations to have risk share agreements, ACOs, and a number of other uh, frameworks, uh, we really have to dramatically change what we're doing in patient safety and quality because uh, now safety and quality is becoming mainstream and it really is becoming a strategic uh, weapon uh, in the environment to uh, have a huge impact on improving care uh, and the economics of the populations that we serve. On slide 14, I have simplified this graphic and, and call it from the first curve to the second curve. And in a recent speech at the open of the uh, American Society of Anesthesiologists addressed this issue of the innovation zone, which is this zone of disruption, if we want to coin one of our partners' uh, terms, uh, uh, an opportunity for uh, disruptive innovation by Clay Christensen, who we often uh, uh, quote. And really, this is the arena that we, and there won't be any spectators. Uh, we're all going to have to make a, a huge jump to the second curve, and it really depends on where we are on the first curve. But the, this is our arena of disruption. Um, on slide 15, I address some of the topics that we recently learned from uh, interaction and, and d discussions with CDC that we will be building on in January and, and on through the first quarter. And that is uh, that uh, we're finding that there are mass infection outbreaks from procedures. Um, there are numerous patient recalls that we would call the tip of the iceberg, meaning that they've been invisible, they're becoming more and more visible, where we've got systems breakdowns in our procedure uh, suites, such as those are, that are imaging inpatient and outpatient suites, ultrasound, uh, ERCP in the, uh, in the OR, uh, a number of procedural breakdowns. And now, because of big data, we're now starting to see where these infections are popping up. And as CDC goes into these organizations, they're seeing breakdowns in basic infection prevention procedures. Now, what's happening is that, that this huge move towards expanding provider networks and acquisitions, the term toxic tail we got from CDC, they're recognizing as we're consolidating narrow networks that inpatient facilities or, buy, or organizations are buying smaller acute care facilities and their standard of care may not be at the same level and not only are they acquiring the risk, the accumulative risk of infections that may have been generated even before they bought them, but they're also acquiring this um, a huge uh, requirement for safety upgrade expenses and this is because um, as they grow and make these acquisitions, they now have to have a standard of care across their organizations. And there's an, un, um, an unaccounted for expense of upgrading them in terms of the basic practices, but also uh, instrument reprocessing uh, and uh, ha uh, hand hygiene, and actually even having patients washing their hands, which we've really not been thinking about. And when we think about uh, Clostridium difficile, we realize that patients are vectors as well. What I'd like to do is remind you on slide 16, we use the net promoter score as a way to really measure interest in things, uh, patient satisfaction, caregiver satisfaction, and it comes from Fred Reichelt in the book, The Ultimate Question, that I frequently quote. And we, the concept is, is that you pull an audience and ask for them to answer a question. Would you recommend this product or service? Or would you be interested in this product or service? Or would you be interested in this safety prevention opportunity? And, and give them a scale of 1 to 10. Nines and 10s earn you a plus 1. 1s to 6s earn you a minus 1. And passives, which are a 7 and, and an 8. And typically, healthcare administrators love to hear, wow, that's pretty good, a 7 or an 8. That means above average. But we all know chasing uh, the the only way that, you know, that, that we're going to improve is by benchmarking the top, not trying to be the cream of the crap, to use a, a term that's now in the literature. And I know I'm not being on PC by using it because we use that term all the time now as we talk about really trying to improve. So we asked you uh, in our last webinar um, the question, we need to understand safety issues for procedural care, such as interventional radiology and in ultrasound suites, as an example, scale of 1 to 10. And these were your numbers. 
nines and tens were a plus one, sevens and an eights were a zero, detractors were a one through six. And it turns out that your net promoter score, if you look at this, 65% of you respondents uh, were a 10. Uh, and this was 664 organizations, 189 responses. 9% were nines. And if we undertook a net promoter score measure, uh, what you see uh, is a net promoter score of 62. And what that, that is a very high net promoter score. So I think we're aware that we've got a problem and that we're going to dig down into that in 2014. Uh, but this was an enormous uh, number of nines and tens. And when you take those that were not interested, it's still a huge number. So that's a net promoter score of uh, 62. So as we look at infection prevention, and again, now I'm, I'm closing out my uh, six or seven minutes of addressing this. As we look at imaging procedure, the imaging procedure continuum, most of us that are safety and quality leaders have not embarked into imaging. Uh, I'm a radiation oncologist cross-trained in radiology, and I understand that because I was a, a huge referrer when I was a, pr a practicing physician. But most of us, and most of the folks in imaging, have not been really focused on upstream prevention, meaning are, the, are we bringing vectors of infection into the procedure suite? Are we practicing the latest state-of-the-art best practices during procedures? And the problem downstream is that we don't have data systems to track those infections because the majority of them pop up after an inpatient is discharged or in the outpatient environment, we don't track them at all. But we're now finding with big data that we're finding a huge number of these. And we're, the way that we found this out was because of outbreaks of uh, antibiotic resistant uh, uh, organisms that have caused deaths. And this is very close to our heart because one of our close team members is a trustee, a patient safe, the patient safety committee chair of one of our largest urban hospitals who had one of her family members die. And the hospital did not notify her that they had the infection. So not only was it an egregious thing to not be notified, but the hospital knew it, and this woman ultimately went to hospice and died. So it's very close to our heart, and this is what tipped us off, that this was a really big problem. And now we're really, uh, we're really focusing on it as we look at acquisition. So now as I introduce Dr. Greg Boats, what I'd like to do is just finish with this slide. The found, and, and I really developed this with Dr. Boats. Uh, we have to have a foundation of patient safety. Our individual specialties, and we're working with Dr. Boats in anesthesia and critical care, and we're working in radiology with the American Board of Radiology and American College, that individual specialties have to really maintain the core knowledge. And then there's new knowledge that we're adding to each of those specialties. And that is uh, the really critically important uh, uh, specialty expertise. Now, in addition to that, with maintenance of certification, we've got to add performance improvement projects. And none of our specialties have really learned uh, and really been focusing on it because, look, they've got to maintain their core knowledge as well as the new knowledge in their specialty. And that's where I think some of our leading innovation projects you're going to see from us as we go forward are in applying PI to those individual specialties. And this will tie to maintenance and certification. And so uh, Greg and I and a number of uh, team members with our program called Care University uh, are going to be rolling these out uh, across specialties. So now uh, I'm done. What I'd like to do is now introduce uh, Dr. Greg Boats. Uh, uh, Dr. Boats is a terrific uh, doctor. He, he is a leader, a professor of anesthesiology and critical care uh, at MD Anderson. Uh, I have the wonderful opportunity of doing my medical oncology training uh, there as part of radiation oncology, a terrific organization. Very dedicated uh, teacher, uh, researcher, uh, developer of performance improvement. And we've asked him uh, today to take a short time to present some of the lessons learned in critical care. You're going to hear from him in 2014, as we hope we will, from Dr. Kennerly, who we hear from a little bit later, in a, in a much bigger way with uh, much broader training programs that we'll offer through Care University. However, we wanted him to introduce some of the, the patient safety lessons that, that we've learned. Not only that, but he trained at, uh, at, at, at Stanford, and he takes his time off to go to Stanford and ride the helicopter and train uh, critical care leaders at Stanford as a continued commitment to Stanford. So he's a, another example of one of our great uh, servant leaders behind the scenes doing great things for all of us. Uh, uh, Greg, take it away. Dr. Denham, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to this group today on this webinar. 
Um, I'm a rather late uh, comer to the patient safety and quality improvement movement, and I'd like to spend a little time describing how uh, my journey was in critical care and patient safety and some of the things that we've done at MD Anderson and the University of Texas system um, in uh, quality improvement and patient safety. Uh, I have no relevant uh, financial relationships to disclose. Um, and I'm uh, at the risk of, uh, of uh, preaching to the choir. I think we all know that hospitals can be very dangerous places. Uh, almost 14 years ago, the Institute of Medicine published Two Errors Human, where they conservatively estimated that uh, somewhere between 44 and 98,000 patients died per year of preventable medical errors or injuries. Uh, that's an astounding statistic. Uh, and if we think about broadening that to the outpatient arena and the long-term care arena, I'm sure the number is much larger than that. If you think about that, being in a, in a U.S. hospital is a leading cause of death. And there's a lot that we can do to focus on how to improve the care that we deliver in our hospitals. And this is my domain. This is a MD Anderson ICU. It's a tertiary care ICU with 54 beds, about 3,600 admissions per year. Uh, these are the sickest of the sick patients in the hospitals. We use a variety of monitoring techniques, uh, both non-invasive and invasive, and a number of life support techniques to try to support organ function while we're trying to reverse the underlying cause. Our patients are very vulnerable to uh, significant injury from medication or other errors in, uh, in their care. Uh, in 1999, around the time that the Institute of Medicine report came out, I became medical director of this ICU. And I put our team together to see what sort of care are we actually delivering in, in this ICU. And I think the most important question we asked is, how safe is our ICU? Uh, the problem is that most of the ways that people try to detect things in, in life really didn't apply uh, to the healthcare arena. Uh, we were rather unarmed in our ability to critically look at the care that we were delivering. And um, I'm embarrassed to say, but this is the sum total of my medical school experience in healthcare delivery improvement. I had no idea uh, how to go about uh, actually uh, evaluating, measuring, and changing uh, the care that we were delivering for our patients. Around the same time, in 1999, in Journal of Pediatrics, Paul Plesik uh, published this article on quality improvement methods in clinical medicine. I think this was my aha moment. I read this and it, and it resounded to me that there are tools, there are methodologies that can be used to evaluate the care that we're doing. And um, most of that uh, technology and toolkit came from other industries. It was just not used uh, widely in medicine. Uh, so the challenges that we have in our ICU is that uh, we have uh, predominantly cancer patients who are either suffering from the consequences of the cancer or the treatment of cancer including pretty profound pancytopenia. Our patients have no white blood cell count, so they have no immune system to fight off infection. They also have the consequences of some pretty nasty poisons that we use to try to treat cancers, so the chemotherapy can have very significant organ system dysfunction. And in our bone marrow transplantation population, we have a very significant inflammatory response associated with both engraftment and the graft-versus-host disease that we see pretty often in that population. Now, as the medical director, I looked for some of the quality indicators that were important to measure in our population. And these are the data we had when we started. And I'm, I'm not proud of them, but I, I want to tell you that our ventilator-associated pneumonia rate was 34 out of 1,000 patient days. Um, that's not a good number to report. Now, most of our patients had no immune system, so the likelihood that they would come to the ICU with a, a pneumonia was, was relatively high. Um, our central line infections were in line with, the, with good performance, but the caveat was that most of our patients came to the ICU with central lines in place already. So our opportunity to attribute a central line infection to an ICU patient who received their line in the ICU was low. So that's a deceptively low number. Also, other indicators that people use for um, safe practices and patient safety uh, monitoring, uh, our hand hygiene observations were atrocious. At best, we were 70 to 85 percent compliance with hand hygiene in the ICU, the place where patients could be at the most significant risk for infection. So we had a lot of work to do to try to uh, work to uh, improve the care that we were delivering. And some of my colleagues said, well, why, why are we measuring this? What, what are we going to do with this? And, and I turned to Deming, uh, who said, you can't manage what you don't measure. And that was 
you know, our reason for investing time and effort to learn about the infection rates and our performance rates and other things that we did. But again, I felt rather unarmed because I didn't have facility with the tools and the technology to do this. We use the uh, measurements in order to improve our performance to actually look at what our actual versus desired performance is for any particular process and to hold each other accountable so we reduce the variability in the care that we uh, provide to patients and also to better inform decisions and how we should provide care. When new guidelines come out or best practices are published, we want to look at those and gather data about their implementation to make sure we aren't making things worse by changing some part of our process. And that's all by using measurement in our system. Now, uh, quality improvement comes in a lot of different uh, uh, programs and methodology. Um, they come from a variety of different industries. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Lean and Six Sigma, which are prescribed methods for uh, teaching and, and measuring performance in, in systems. Uh, there's also the Improvement Roadmap or the PDSA um, methodology, Rapid Cycle Improvement. Also, all of these uh, tools and, and technologies have been available, but they haven't really penetrated into medicine as well as they should. And as I said, during my training, I had no exposure to any of these things. This was all new to me. So as a medical director of an ICU, I felt rather unarmed in being able to um, actually do supervisory tests to look at the care that we were delivering. So I had the opportunity to go to Salt Lake City and attend the advanced training program in healthcare delivery improvement with Brent James at Intermountain Healthcare. Um, our institution invested in sending a number of faculty and, uh, and other clinicians to, uh, to Salt Lake City to this four-month uh, course where you spend a week a month uh, in the classroom uh, working on both uh, knowledge and tool um, use and also having projects uh, to do in the meantime and homework when you weren't in Salt Lake City. And this was really um, uh, the most invigorating part of my career uh, to that point was is, is going to this program and learning the tools and the technology and the, the approach to actually uh, understand and measure the performance that we have in, in healthcare. And what I learned there is that quality improvement is the science of process management. Uh, healthcare, just like any other industry, is a system made up of interlinked processes. So we could look at my environment in the perioperative period and find the major milestones as people move through that process and then drill down on each of those and find the, the the large set of processes that were in place that uh, that were involved in those particular epochs of care, and we could learn whether there was waste or whether there was inefficiency or whether there was harm that could be imparted to our patients. Um, and we use these tools that come from those other industries. These are probably not uh, unfamiliar to, to this audience. Uh, there are the tools that generate or concentrate uh, expert opinion across a group, and then there are tools that organize, analyze, and focus information for problem solving, and I'll tell you the most important for me, were the, um, the, the knowledge to use uh, flow charts, run charts, and SBC charts to not only uh, analyze our data, but to visually present the data to our team so that they could see how we were doing both uh, in a snapshot and over time. Um, I think that of all of the methodologies that are available for quality improvement, I think the improvement roadmap is one that resonates best with clinicians. Uh, it's based on uh, the work by Langley and Nolan. It has four major milestones. Uh, the aim statement, which is what are we trying to accomplish, uh, some measurement so that we know that a change is an improvement, and then a formulation of some change concept that we're going to use to try to see if we can make uh, things better for our patients uh, in the long run. And that change concept is what are we going to do that will result in an improvement. And once we've come up with that change concept, we test it in a small cohort of patients using the PDSA cycle. If it's favorable, we continue to do that and maybe spread it to uh, a larger cohort of patients or upstream and downstream from that part of the process. If it doesn't seem to be uh, resulting in improvement, we go back to the drawing board and we haven't really invested a lot in changing the whole care delivery for a large number of patients. This is what's worked best in my institution and across the UT system. So lo and behold, the 100,000 Lives campaign comes out and boy, there are six planks here that are all really directed at care in the ICU. So we put teams together to address each of these issues because we wanted to critically look at the care we were delivering and try to reduce the potential for harm to our patients. Uh, our senior leadership put together uh, the group that went to Salt Lake City and we formulated our own uh, training program. We called it Clinical Safety and Effectiveness Training Program. And uh, it's a sister program to the IHC program. It's uh, a two-day per month for four months based on the mini ATP at uh, Intermountain Healthcare. We use a variety of internal and external faculty to teach the course. 
I think it's really important to have internal faculty that present their work because that gives street credibility immediately to those uh, naysayers in the group that say, that's really great, but it doesn't really apply to our patients. Showing data from our own patients is a very compelling story. We use a facilitated team project method. Uh, we match up uh, our teams with either graduates from our program who are interested in facilitating, or we have a number of our performance improvement uh, staff who will work with a team to uh, go over their project and work on their aim statement, uh, identify where their data stream may lie, and figure out how they're going to gather it over time, and then how to analyze and present that data in a meaningful way for their, for their project. Um, a critical element was having senior leadership buy-in. In fact, that was not a problem in our institution. Uh, most of our senior leaders were enrolled in our first two classes, so we uh, engaged them very quickly into the importance of this course. Um, we believe in, in rewards and recognition for the work that people are doing. In academic centers, there's very little opportunity for uh, recognition of this work in the appointments and promotion process. Uh, we've driven that into the um, promotions process at, at MD Anderson and at other institutions in the UT system, but you have to have something that is meaningful for the provider to keep them engaged. If they have to choose between doing an article in the literature or doing this work, um, if they can't get promoted, they're going to choose uh, something else. Um, but what we were really doing with this course was building a cadre of QI and patient safety champions. We wanted to arm the front line with the skills and the knowledge base to be able to critically evaluate the care they're delivering and to be a resource for others who may be wanting to do something that touched their process uh, so that they understood that this is why we're doing it and I'm willing to help you. There wasn't going to be an obstruction because uh, you were crossing into my arena. Uh, eventually, the chancellor of the UT system asked us to expand this to all six uh, healthcare sites in the UT system. Over time, we were able to bring in some fellows, residents, and uh, students into the program as part of our teams. Over the last seven years, we've had about 1,900 graduates from our programs with uh, uh, almost 600 completed projects. Uh, fortunately, we've been able to uh, put together an annual UT system conference where we, again, get national faculty to come in and talk about uh, important issues in quality improvement and patient safety. And also, it's an opportunity for some of the UT system faculty to present. This year, we had 90 abstracts submitted, and we had them presented in both oral and poster presentation formats. Um, I was also able to start a, UC, a UT System uh, CSNE fellowship program, which recognizes accomplishments and dedication to quality improvement and patient safety on the part of faculty. They're appointed as fellows in the system, and our chancellor uh, recognizes them and uses them in ways to promote patient safety, both. Uh, in their institutions and even into the medical and nursing uh, school um, curricula. Um, so our clinical safety and effectiveness uh, program included a number of our critical care faculty. Almost all have been through the program. Um, I want to drill down and talk about some of the projects that we took, undertook uh, um, in the first several years of our program. Uh, my project when I went to Intermountain Healthcare was uh, deploying a rapid response team. and. Uh, it's been very, very well received in our institution. Um, over the deployment period, we dropped the out-of-ICU cardiac arrest rate by 67% and held it for many years. And now our rapid response team is a very vital portion of, uh, of our care delivery system, and it's a very strong resource for the bedside nurses to, to call upon um, in circumstances, especially when they're not really sure what's going on, but they know the patient is heading in the wrong direction. Um, we've had teams that have worked on ventilator management, including ventilator weaning, doing spontaneous awakening trials, spontaneous breathing trials, and more recently, uh, early mobilization. We've identified a number of patients in our ICU who are not quite ready to be extubated, but are pretty close. And we want to get them up and moving both to improve their respiratory conditioning, but also their overall conditioning, and that may be helpful in a number of different ways. For instance, uh, by getting up and exercising them during the day, they sleep better at night. We uh, can reestablish better sleep-wake cycles, and we've reduced our ICU delirium incidence. Uh, we've worked on early enteral nutrition. One of our frustrations has been from the time we decide to feed someone until they actually start uh, feeding is often a 48-hour uh, delay because we go through the vicious cycle of putting in a feeding tube, finding out it's not where we want it, either repositioning it or putting a new one in and going through that cycle several times, and the patient's not getting nutrition. We've actually uh, made shortcuts in that to make sure that we start feeding as soon as possible. 
We've reduced blood draw events in our ICU. Obviously, we do a lot of tests in our patients. Uh, we found that there were uh, sort of redundancies in the number of tests that were being done, and we tried to cohort those uh, with the help of our uh, nursing staff so that we have been able to drop uh, blood draw events in the ICU by 25% and held it there over, um, over the last year. We've had a number of teams do handoff communication projects both in the ICU between staff but also between the transitions in care. Uh, really uh, important information can be lost if uh, handoff isn't done well between the emergency room and the ICU or between the operating room and the ICU. And we have a lot of work uh, to, to do, uh, making that a, a more um, solid process. Uh, we've had several teams working on procedural safety. Uh, the first was a project looking at ultrasound in uh, central line placement. We've had teams working on universal protocol and other procedural safety practices to make sure that we don't add risk to our patients. We are a training center, and so we have a number of residents and fellows that come through, and we have to make sure that our processes are as bulletproof as possible to reduce the risk to patients. Um, obviously, in an ICU, we have a significant uh, population with sepsis, so we've had a number of projects looking at sepsis management. And most importantly, I think, is the early identification of the patient at risk outside the ICU. We've tried to implement early warning systems using our electronic medical records and other uh, strategies to identify patients early before they have significant organ dysfunction to give them the best chance at a best outcome. And also, as the sepsis management guidelines have changed over the years with the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, we've had teams looking at our best practices to make sure that our protocols uh, were in alignment with those uh, recommendations in the guidelines. So that's what we've done in critical care and in the MD Anderson and UT system arena. Uh, but I'm not satisfied with that. I want to I wanna make sure that every clinician has the opportunity to gain this education and skill set to be able to critically evaluate the care that they deliver to their patients. And there's a lot of reasons to do that now with the uh, Affordable Care Act and with some of the ACGME requirements. But we couldn't find a way to entice the private practitioner who is running a business business to spend a significant amount of time away from his practice to learn these skills and tools. And one way that we found that we can hook these people is uh, through maintenance of certification. The 24 specialty boards in the American Board of Medical Specialties have as part of the maintenance of certification process a practice performance improvement project where the um, candidate has to um, identify something in their practice, gather data, make a change, and then reevaluate to see if that was an improvement or not. A lot like the improvement roadmap that we talked about earlier. Uh, but the problem is most of these practitioners have had no experience like I did. Um, they've been through medical school with absolutely no uh, formal training in using these tools. And so finding a way to build an educational program that will allow them to um, do these projects in a meaningful way rather than just the, um, you know, gather a little bit of data and uh, show a little bit of improvement and I've satisfied the requirement. I want this to be a long-lasting part of their practice moving forward so that they can critically evaluate the care they deliver. Uh, we're also doing things to drive quality improvement and patient safety into residency training programs. Uh, recently, the uh, ACGME, the governing body for graduate medical education, has come out with a CLEAR project which is the clinical learning environment review, where they have site visits looking at the environment in which uh, trainees learn. And a big part of that is looking at patient safety education as part of their education and their involvement in quality improvement and patient safety activities in the institution. They're specifically looking for quality improvement and patient safety leadership in the program leadership and, and faculty in the training programs. And as well, we're trying to drive patient safety and quality improvement uh, methodology and tools into the medical and nursing school curricula so that our future trainees are coming out armed with the tools to uh, not only deliver good care but critically evaluate the care that they're, that they're giving. So this gets me back to my environment. This is where I work. These are my patients. It's incredibly risky. It's incredibly dangerous to our patients. Uh, minor errors in care delivery here can have significant consequences in a patient's outcome. And so we're doing all we can to not only deliver the best care we can, but to, to pay attention to the way that we're performing to make sure that we are delivering the best care reliably and consistently over time. And to get back to the data that I talked to you about a little bit ago, 
since we uh, started these quality improvement uh, efforts, I'm no longer the medical director of the ICU, but I'm proud to say that our ventilator-associated pneumonia rate is well below the national uh, benchmark. In fact, we've only had two ventilator-associated pneumonias in the past fiscal year, and I think we had one the year before that, and that's in relatively sick patients. Our uh, catheter-related uh, bloodstream infections are well below the benchmark as well. Uh, we've gone uh, more than one year without a CLABC in our surgical population, and we've had, I think, two in the medical population uh, over the last fiscal year. Um, our challenges are still the catheter-related UTIs and uh, other performance measures. Um, on the hand hygiene front, our last uh, month's measurements, we were 97% and 100% on two separate observation periods in the ICU. So we're holding each other accountable for uh, following uh, best practices and safe practices for our patients. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present uh, my story in, in critical care and quality improvement. Well, fantastic. Uh, thanks so much, Greg. And I know that uh, a number of us will be interested uh, to hear uh, about how we can apply some of the lessons learned in our ICUs across the country. And you and I are working on a paper with a number of uh, leaders from organizations on the five rights of cancer patients and cancer patient safety. So um, we know that they're a unique population with 10,000 seniors uh, developing a day. We have 10,000 people turning 65 every day. Cancer is related to age. And for the 19, next 19 years, we're going to have 10,000 seniors who we're going to have to be careful for, who, many of whom will have some of these cancers. Uh, there's a, a great opportunity to kind of know about the unique population. I'm going to turn to Don Kennerly. Uh, uh, Don both has his MD and PhD. He is the Chief Quality Officer for Baylor, Baylor Health System. And as you may know, uh, Baylor uh, merged with their acquired uh, uh, Scott & White, so they're, gra they're continuing to grow. 16 hospitals, 150, um, uh, pr uh, 150 plus ambulatory care uh, facilities. And he previously served as the Chief Patient Safety Officer. We've known Don a long time. He's always been a dedicated, uh, a dedicated patient safety leader and really uh, provided great focus on the rigor uh, that we have in how we measure those things. And so he was a major contributor to Baylor's vision in patient safety of no preventable deaths and no preventable harm. Uh, in addition, he's led a number of, of, of uh, very important safety programs and he has been a contributor to the literature uh, uh, develop, uh, in the development of the literature for the trigger tools that are used to detect and quantify and characterize adverse events. Dr. Klassen, uh, who developed the trigger tool concept uh, uh, and contributed to the IHI work, has uh, often been a speaker with us. Um, so what we'd like to do is allow, uh, allow and ask Dr. Kennerly to present um, their, the, the work that they have now embodied in a terrific book uh, and have really given us uh, wonderful uh, references and an evidence-based approach to safety and quality, and I'll let him tell his story. Don. Well, thanks, Chuck. Um, it's really a pleasure to uh, be able to, uh, to join uh, those of you who are uh, able to uh, come on board and uh, I, I will reassure you that I will stick to the, the time limits, even though I've got a lot of uh, data in here. Um, I think, like Dr. Boats, uh, I uh, was a little bit of a latecomer to uh, quality. I spent about 15 years as an academic physician and got bitten by the quality bug and have been uh, sort of uh, really enjoying uh, doing that work in, in the last uh, decade and a half. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that I'd like to, uh, to share with you folks um, is that uh, we have uh, uh, been working on, on, on the notion of, uh, of STEEP. And so um, let me see. Let me just get. OK, here we go. OK. Um, this is the um, acronym that we use, of course, is, the, is what the uh, Institute of Medicine uh, challenged us with, to be thinking about care that is uh, broadly uh, safe, timely, effective, uh, efficient, equitable, and patient-centered. And uh, at about the time of this report, uh, we had a, a board uh, resolution uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, challenged us to, uh, to do well in this area and that placed safety and quality at the highest priority for our organization. And uh, that uh, resolution in 2000 was uh, reasserted in 2010. 
And at that time, um, uh, Dr. David Ballard, who was the, uh, uh, the Chief Quality Officer at the time for Baylor, who has now become the Chief Quality Officer for now our merged entity, Baylor, Scott & White Health, and no, we did not acquire them. It was a merger, a very friendly merger, and uh, we're learning a lot from them. But at, uh, in, uh, he thought about the notion that maybe it would be useful to other organizations to have us uh, provide some uh, vignettes about how we think about using the concepts of these domains of, uh, of, that the IOM sketched out to uh, uh, share our journey over the past decade with regard to uh, uh, quality and safety. As a, a brief introduction to, uh, again, the former Baylor Healthcare System, that is what we now call the, the northern part of the, the merged entity, uh, you can see it's a, it's a relatively large uh, hospital system. Um, it has a physician hospital organization as well, um, and it's geographically localized to the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. And uh, we, we have uh, enjoyed being uh, merged with Scott & White. And uh, one of the things that's fun about that is that Scott & White is a very high quality organization as well. And shown on this slide is uh, just some data we took from Hospital Compare in terms of our actual publicly reported performance and um, created an overall score from all of that. And uh, our, that is the, the Northern Division now was uh, 11th out of 270 organizations overall in our Scott & White uh, colleagues, uh, now the central region was 46th, and so uh, again, we're, uh, we feel like we have a lot of opportunities to, uh, to share good practices between ourselves. So that's uh, sort of the overview of who we are. And again, to return to this, um, this um, the notion of STEEP, you can see that we, we have this uh, branding, if you will, of STEEP around our organization to help call attention to this as a key organizing principle for the delivery of healthcare. But it also reminds us that this is really a tough challenge, and uh, that is that the, the climb is steep and takes a lot of uh, effort to, uh, to get there. I won't spend an enormous amount of time on detailing these, but I do want to introduce you to what I would say are some key infrastructural elements uh, associated with uh, the way we organize our care to achieve goals in STEEP. Uh, I mentioned the resolutions of our board, but uh, like Dr. Boats had shared, we have, uh, we have something we call the STEEP Academy, which is uh, two and a half to three days. Uh, of uh, in-class time with a required performance improvement project that has rolled out to everyone uh, at the director level and above. And I think we have uh, about 10% uh, of folks who have not yet done that. But if they don't, they don't get their incentive compensation. So um, pretty significant motivation there. Increasingly, uh, an, an increasing component of things over the years has been that uh, in the past, uh, Baylor's in executive incentive compensation aligned with finance primarily. Uh, now the uh, attainments uh, are defined by quality and service uh, to 70% to of the total. Um, and that has obviously uh, changed uh, executive attention to many of these uh, objectives and I think is a key part of uh, providing incentives and whether it's tenure or compensation, uh, the goal is to get traction in whatever way as you can. A, uh, an important group as well is having a very strong uh, measurement analytics and reporting group to be able to provide feedback to uh, those who are doing care and doing the improvements so that they have a good sense of how it's actually going because, again, um, with the concept that Dr. Boats in, introduced of you can't manage what you don't measure, we've had a very strong commitment to that. And, um, and as, uh, as uh, uh, Chuck mentioned, we've developed some tools which we'll share a few of those on. And, and his notion about big data, uh, again, that's key. And when you get to be a reasonably sized organization, you can come up with a number of things you didn't know you didn't know. And I think those are, have been very helpful for us. Uh, we align all of our performance improvement resources uh, to the corporate level so that everyone in hospital levels that are doing performance improvement work as a full-time job or even a major part-time uh, part job uh, have reports to the system level. 
Uh, the hospital leaders obviously create priorities, but we want to have alignment with the uh, corporate objectives, and this helps to create it. And uh, transparency, of course, is something which helps to move things more quickly. Um, what I'd like to do is just briefly share with you one of the things that we did um, sort of trying to uh, sort of walk the talk here was um, what's shown here is that we have organized the coordination of clinical operations around the steep domains. And so we have what's called the Steep Governance Council, which is a corporate entity uh, that is uh, a group of seven of the C-suite members that is chaired by the chief quality officer. And its recommendations, are, are uh, which are often over somewhat contentious issues, uh, are taken uh, to the president for final uh, uh, implementation and approval. But uh, reporting to that group are the, uh, the, uh, the subcommittees that represent the components of STEEP. And they are charged with working with one another and with the service lines and business support services in order to tee up what are the priorities of the organization. And so as a result, that's where we have difficult discussions around the tensions between financial performance and, say, safety, uh, and try to come to uh, some agreement about things. And this has been a very helpful uh, framework for uh, issue uh, management, if you will, in these complex times that, uh, as Chuck points out, are sort of the need for innovation to get to the second curve. This, uh, again, now I'm going to shift to uh, share a little bit of some vignettes across our, uh, the steep domains, if you will, in terms of some things we've been working on. I'll start off with safe care. Our vision, as uh, Chuck mentioned, of no preventable deaths, no preventable injuries and risk is uh, a challenging one to be sure, but, uh, uh, and we try to employ the uh, tactics listed there around making sure that we uh, have the right culture, uh, that we have safe processes in place uh, that are evidence-based, uh, and that our technology is uh, supportive of, uh, of uh, safe outcomes. And along those lines, one of the things that I'll, I will mention is that we've modified the IHI Global Trigger Tool, and I'll give you a little bit of some of our data. But for those who aren't as familiar with it, it's a very nice method developed by Roger Riesard, David Klassen, and others that we've modified over time. And we have uh, published a number of papers uh, along these lines, and we actually have used this continuously for six years. And I think uh, one of the few organizations that I think has done that um, we review um, using expert nurse reviewers about 2% of our, our records for patients with length of stay of three days or more. And our goal is to really identify how often we have adverse events um, in order for us to be able to uh, target our uh, improvements in areas where uh, we have problems. Uh, one of the things that we did was to develop an electronic application for data analysis and trending. Uh, related to the identified adverse events when uh, our nurse reviewers uh, review these records. And I'm going to cut very quickly to the chase here. Uh, and again, there's some uh, references that are in the uh, back of this presentation of some of the work we've published. But a key observation for us was that although many organizations were well aware of adverse drug events, hospital-acquired infection, VTE, and others as being important areas to work on, we found that a very sizable fraction of our adverse events, in fact, related to procedures and surgery. And this really um, uh, was something that redirected our efforts to spend more time on the safety and effectiveness of our uh, work in ORs. Uh, and, uh, and I'll share a little bit of uh, some of our, our work along those lines. Uh, that was, uh, we wouldn't probably have done if we didn't know how uh, the fraction of adverse events. I will also mention to you that, in fact, to give you a sense of the rate of adverse events we've identified, 36% uh, of our patients uh, have an adverse event. 23% uh, uh, of our inpatients have a hospital-acquired adverse event. 13% uh, come to the hospital as a consequence of an adverse event. And so um, uh, these are rates that I think were unexpected. We worked with uh, the, uh, uh, the OIG uh, as in their landmark study uh, that showed uh, the rates uh, of adverse events to Medicare beneficiaries. 
And we include in the rates that I mentioned uh, some of the milder ones that the OIG didn't include. But fully 7% of our patients have an adverse event that extended length of stay or worse. And this was really a big wake-up call for us. And uh, we were very glad we had uh, done this work to characterize uh, adverse events. Another tool that we've used is the uh, we've uh, developed our own patient safety culture survey, in part because ARC hadn't released theirs yet. And we've actually stuck with that in, in part because uh, ours is, I think, a little simpler. It focuses on four domains, not 12, leadership resources, teamwork, reporting, and feedback, uh, in a sense, learning. And um, we've developed some uh, t learning tools that we feed back to our leaders so that there are rounding tools that we give because we have hospital, uh, excuse me, uh, unit level data that characterize the level of leadership resources and teamwork and reporting that their uh, clinicians have, are reporting back uh, to um, in, as part of this survey. So, um, one of the things I'll share with you is another area. Uh, we adopted the uh, Safe Surgery Saves Lives uh, uh, processes that the, the World Health Organization uh, uh, encouraged uh, a number of years ago. We thought that was great. Um, and um, uh, one of the things that we were uh, concerned about, though, was that, in fact, maybe we weren't, uh, we, was that all of these reports that suggested we were doing it 100% of the time even when we put people in ORs to observe or when people generated documentation, just it seemed like that was too good to be true. And in fact, that's turned out to be uh, true. And um, one of the things that we found was that actually we were down in the uh, high 80s of percent uh, when in fact uh, the staff in the OR were anonymously surveyed and we asked them whether the checklist was being used as well as we thought they would want if they were the patient or a family member was the patient. Because in fact, that's really the test, isn't it? It's whether we're giving care that's as good as we'd like to receive. And so uh, over time, uh, we rounded with that data in hand, which was, I think, an, uh, sort of embarrassing to many, uh, both physician and nursing leaders, uh, and uh, did a series of things over time. Uh, that are listed in this interventions uh, list here and uh, really encourage, for example, what we refer to as stopping the line, which is a, is a formal uh, policy that says that people have to pay attention when someone uses the term, I need some clarity, which means they think a safety event is uh, uh, potentially imminent. And, uh, and, and the staff were uncomfortable about doing that, and now they're much more comfortable along those lines. And, uh, and so our uh, progress over, we also implemented an OR passport, if you will, which I'm sure is something along the lines of what others have done in order to, uh, uh, to demonstrate, in fact, that the things that are needed are done. And um, uh, as part of the uh, pre-op interview, the checklist and the passport completion by other folks, uh, they like this a lot. Um, and then as a result, here's what uh, our data turned out to be in 2009 when we first started doing this. We were in the high 80s. Now we're not as doing as well as we'd like, but uh, are at least up to 94% in terms of the degree to which the staff feel as though the care is as good as they would like to receive uh, in the operating rooms. And, uh, and so I think we uh, uh, still have some work to do. Uh, the, the surgeon active participation rate went from the low 70s to the mid 80s, and we're, uh, and, uh, we're still working on that. Um, now, it's just to shift to a different topic, uh, to achieve safe and effective care, an example in some of our portfolio of work is uh, work we did uh, related to goals for uh, open heart surgery. And, uh, we uh, had looked at our data and we found that, in fact, we were below national benchmarks for both processes and some outcomes, uh, despite the fact that we enjoyed a good reputation in the community. Uh, again, our challenge from leaders is to, is to say it, it, our reputation is great, but we need to be able to prove it. So uh, one, some of the things that we did over time was to, to gather our uh, cardiovascular leaders together and uh, gave them uh, improvement tools. Again, many of them that I think Dr. Boats had gone over with you folks and uh, earlier. And, uh, 
And then they were, we had a, a semi-annual meeting of all CV surgeons where we started off with blinded data and now it's unblinded about individual physician performance around outcomes as sensitive as not only processes but mortality. And, uh, and so uh, those things have uh, been helpful uh, as well as standardized checklists and a variety of the kinds of things that I think you're familiar with. But uh, here is uh, sort of what the uh, progress has been in terms of our uh, risk-adjusted mortality over the years that we've been doing this work. And you can see that our uh, isolated cabbage results uh, have dramatically improved. Uh, and uh, our, uh, our isolated uh, uh, aortic valve replacements have sim uh, similarly improved and are better than national performance. And in fact, uh, our, the, our two hospitals that did the uh, most work in this area uh, received uh, three-star ratings from S STS, which is one of only 24 hospitals in the country that uh, had that kind of recognition. So, I think this just shows that the kind of principles of uh, performance improvement and transparency and, uh, and culture are able to really drive some important outcomes. Um, looking at uh, in the effective care area, one of the things that we want to do is to reduce overuse of, uh, of medically non-beneficial care. And uh, we found that we were uh, really doing uh, way too much uh, lumbar spine MRIs by our Health Texas physicians who are outpatient primary care physicians uh, who uh, work as part of a physician hospital organization compared with 7% in the national comparison group. Um, we did some interventions uh, and, and again most, much of it was feeding back their data. With data, I think physicians and others in healthcare uh, want to do well, and so giving them their data was very helpful. And uh, we uh, gave them tools for uh, improvement. And uh, over time, you can see that what's happened in, uh, is that we've gone from 43% inappropriate to 8% inappropriate. And, uh, and I think the uh, percentage that is uh, clearly appropriate has moved uh, up as well to, uh, uh, again, not as high as we'd like, but certainly, again, that's both a waste issue and an effectiveness issue. Uh, working on, uh, again, efficient and effective care, uh, we uh, have uh, many order sets across the Baylor healthcare system, so I'll just share the results of, of one of them and we, uh, where we spend a little more effort in getting some outcome data. Um, and uh, that has to do with uh, our efforts as it relates to uh, heart failure order set. And again, uh, by gathering experts and deciding on what was uh, evidence-based care uh, using uh, guidelines and uh, uh, recommendations of various national groups uh, uh, and uh, training up uh, a large number of staff members who uh, participate in uh, rapid cycle improvement over a 15-month period um, and sharing uh, unblinded hospital-level and physician-level data uh, around the use of order sets. Uh, things improved dramatically. In fact, we had a uh, we halved our inpatient um, uh, mortality, and uh, we had a decrease of about two thousand dollars in direct costs uh, for uh, related to uh, reductions in, in readmissions. And uh, if we were to expand this out to sort of a projection at a national level, this would reduce uh, fifteen thousand in hospital deaths nationally and about two billion in hospital costs. Uh, uh, for a year, again, uh, at a national level. Um, shifting to patient-centered care, uh, sort of the P of, uh, of Steve, uh, we have, uh, again, had, uh, we think that patients are, are crucial. We appreciate uh, in their participation in their care and really appreciate the, uh, now, the uh, shared decision-making activities that are becoming increasingly prevalent in organizations. Uh, we've done a variety of things as it relates to uh, some work that many of you may have done with Quint Studer initially helped us get, uh, with some tools and the notion that every time we enter a room we acknowledge who we are uh, and acknowledge the patient, introduce who we are, how long we'll talk to them, explaining what we intend to do and thanking them uh, for their time and the opportunity to care for them. And uh, so a number of different activities have been working on uh, the degree to which our uh, 
uh, our patients feel that they're well cared for. And uh, I think we had an opportunity. We were only 72% uh, of our patients uh, gave us uh, sort of a 9 or 10 on the each caps uh, initially, and uh, uh, we uh, and that 72 percent of nurses explain things sufficiently. There's a number of different things beyond what I mentioned, and that is uh, a number of new policies in terms of patients' rights guides, uh, making sure patients can speak up, uh, having uh, uh, an open access uh, for almost every place all the time, and uh, and very strong standardization uh, through guidelines. And as a result, uh, we've uh, worked our way up into uh, about 10 percentage points higher. And so uh, again, we still have a ways to go, but we uh, think that this is um, a substantial improvement. And again, our percentile performance has improved, although again, not to the extent that we'd ultimately like to achieve. So um, I think, uh, again, just to sort of begin to, to tie this up so we can move on to questions and discussion, um, I think uh, these uh, were kind of vignettes of multiple uh, kinds of projects that we've done over the last decade uh, that um, helped to, um, I think, to frame up some of the, the projects that were impactful and give uh, sort of some sense of reality to the notion that these improvement activities uh, that all of us are working on uh, are meaningful and actually help the patient. And, uh, I think something that has been incredibly helpful has been the commitment of our board. Uh, and every month uh, I go and have uh, a uh, very robust discussion with a number of board members and as part of the quality and safety uh, discussions. I can remember one uh, uh, board meeting where I was asked to come to the next meeting and report back how many patients the Baylor Healthcare System had killed in the last quarter. And not just you know uh, with our mortality rate, but uh, that gives you some sense of the intensity of some of our, our board members in terms of recognizing that there are things that don't always happen that are the right things, and they want to know about every single one of them. And uh, and certainly not that we we hide anything from them, but uh, they just wanted to really get under the hood on that topic, and that has helped our mortality improvement. Uh, we've had a 54% reduction in risk-adjusted mortality over the last five years. Um, there, this is an inexpensive. Investments uh, have been made and need to be made in terms of training uh, leaders, much like I think Dr. Boats had mentioned, uh, uh, getting a, the folks who uh, make the decisions and manage uh, other people need to be familiar with quality improvement techniques and uh, how to be able to uh, execute this work at a local level. Although we have strong alignment at the corporate level, we expect the hospitals to be doing much ground, uh, much work at the front line that relates to their own needs, not necessarily the objectives that we might set aside for uh, corporate level improvement. Um, and as I mentioned, I think that the data management components are very substantial. I, we have a a large staff uh, related to uh, being able to uh, collect and manage data so that we can feed it back to the improvement teams that are doing the frontline work. And I think the steep framework is something we now use in everyday language around the uh, organization. Our vision is to be the best place to give and receive care that's safe, quality, and compassionate. And everybody understands in the elevator speech that the uh, steep framework is, in a sense, uh, that quality has to be job one. And um, working closely with our physician uh, is very important. We have uh, most of our physicians are not employed. And so, uh, but they have been very strong participants in this work. Uh, and, uh, and I think, again, uh, increasingly they recognize that this is something that is uh, good for everyone and, uh, and they're willing to provide their, uh, generously provide their time to many quality improvement uh, projects. And for some that spend more time than typical, we have a stipend that we provide uh, to, uh, to those individuals uh, to recognize that we uh, have to be dealing with sort of their lost uh, time from their practices to, uh, to spend uh, two or three days a month on uh, projects that are important. 
And I think, again, uh, as Chuck pointed out, things are changing quickly uh, in terms of expectations, both from a reimbursement perspective, but I think uh, uh, Don Berwick and others have helped to create a, a sense of urgency about moving our outcomes as a nation to, uh, to very high levels so that uh, we can uh, uh, not just be saying we're the best healthcare system in, in the world and not have data that supports the accuracy of that statement, but rather to, in fact, be uh, walking the talk in terms of providing evidence-based care uh, that uh, really achieves health for the community at a cost we can all afford. So uh, again, I think I'll stop there. Those are just some uh, references for uh, publications that uh, we've had on the trigger tool, and we have uh, several others that are uh, in press and will be out uh, fairly soon. So I think so I'll stop Don, there. Yeah. Well, thanks, Don. And I think maybe we'll uh, ask you first, since it's so fresh in our mind and a wonderful overview of what, you, uh, what you've been doing. Um, you know, in the book, you've really gone into some significant detail, and our audience is a big cross-section of, we've got about 15 to 20 percent CEOs, about 70 percent are leaders of quality and safety, and then we have pharmacists, docs, nurses, a wonderful group of uh, nursing leaders uh, that are trainers. Um, just, you know, to ask you the question of, um, for those that are really embarking on as an and a more aggressive patient safety program. What's your advice to them? And then I'll come back to Greg as well and just ask you the same question. You know, you've got some good lessons learned. Now from what you've learned, Don, with this aggressive approach, what advice can you give those that may not be as progressed as, as you all are? What, what lessons learned, big surprises, and here's how I would do it differently. Yeah. Um, I, that's a great question, and I, I think I would um, I would say, you know, with hindsight as a, as a guide, I think some of the things we did were um, were good ideas um, that that helped us to create a sense of urgency. One of them was, in fact, to uh, use the trigger tool at least as a snapshot. I think we've used it as an ongoing monitoring system. But the cost of doing that is just a, a snapshot uh, where one takes, say, uh, six months' worth of data. Uh, and, you, and even if the hospital doesn't want to do it, there are uh, external organizations that can help with that. We've, uh, um, we've worked with an organization, that uh, not ourselves, that has done work in some other healthcare systems to just get a snapshot. But when you begin to start saying that, you know, um, 20 to 25 percent of your inpatients have an adverse event uh, during the course of their care, um, of which 60 percent are possibly preventable and 20 percent are definitely or probably preventable. That really creates some energy around committing to improvement because I think the voluntary reporting system, which is a great learning system, but it, it is not a great measurement system. Um, I think the, uh, we found that only 6% of our adverse events were ever reported in the voluntary reporting system. And the patient safety indicators only identified 2%. So um, I think we would, have, uh, we would suggest that a snapshot of, of the burden of patient injury, again, these are not all errors. These are just in the eyes of the patient. This would be a clinical disappointment. Um, those are things that I think create a great deal of commitment to, uh, to really amplify work in patient safety. And I think I would say, you know, we've got 3,100 hospitals in our research test bed, more than three out of five U.S. hospitals, and we have, uh, have had a lot of private conversations with big groups of hospitals, and I would say they, they, they mirror this experience, that there was a huge wake-up call using the, um, it's almost uh, using the, the, uh, the, the global trigger tool and the, and the medication management trigger tools as, uh, uh, as biopsies to draw more attention, to do more staging of what's actually going on. And then when we, you do that, you open up uh, the opportunity for dialogue. Um, Greg, what are the lessons learned? Now, your area is both in cancer and intensive care in a major cancer center. What advice do you have for our audience who may be dealing with 
their, their sicker patients that are out in the community, and what lessons learned and do's and don'ts and big surprises would you share with somebody like you that was out at the frontline community trying to really build up a patient safety training program and performance improvement? Advice there, surprises, lessons learned? Well, Chuck, I think the, the, the most important lesson that we learned that was that in order to get traction to really drive uh, a critical review of the care that you deliver at the bedside, you have to arm the bedside clinicians with the tools to be able to participate in that process. And I think that we've uh, seen great strides in our ability to uh, look at those processes in our very sick patients because we're all speaking the same vocabulary, we're using some of the same tools, we understand what our data is showing, and uh, we've cut to the chase so that we can actually answer questions. And we can do it both in a snapshot of what's going on in our critically ill patients in a particular issue, but also longitudinally, how are we doing over time? Are we really maintaining our attention to these really critical issues um, in our cancer patients? Um, they're all on a very, uh, uh, complex treatment protocols. Uh, many of them have second and third line medications that are being used. They have comorbidities that are playing into uh, their, their current status. And uh, the more we can make sure that our care is appropriate, that's individualized to them, but also making sure that we're doing the right thing in ventilator management, in DVT prophylaxis, in early mobilization, in making sure we have medication reconciliation and reduce our medication errors, all of those things um, are really important to do in the long term, and by having the bedside staff uh, proficient in the vocabulary and the use of those tools makes it much easier for us to do those, those particular things. So what I'm going to do is, is, now this is not in the acute care environment, and, may, and I'll have you react to it as well, Greg, but I, I'd like to shift back to you, Don. You, you are going through uh, the merger uh, process. And so there are multiple standards of care. We know that you are, uh, you know, you're merging with another terrific organization. So you've got two terrific organizations that are coming together, and yet, uh, and both have enormous uh, outpatient environments. Uh, we are absolutely shocked uh, when we have a conversations with CDC, with the Joint Commission, and talk with a number of the quality improvement organizations as to how big a problem we've got in the outpatient, in the, in the people flowing through imaging and through procedure labs and through outpatient clinics, uh, the almost absence of hand hygiene, the, um, the, you know, we were surprised, I think, uh, Frank, I'd like to have you react and, and maybe uh, get, provide a couple of reflections on our conversations that we've had. We've, our findings were uh, revealed that the study done by CDC of the three-state review of outpatient surgery facilities found enormous breakdowns in patient safety processes and systems. And this is really important for those of you on this audience that are uh, patient safety, inpatient patient safety officers. You are automatically going to become responsible as you acquire these outpatient facilities and outpatient physician offices for a new standard of care that's lower than what you have, and yet you're going to be holding, held accountable for them, we were shocked to hear of breakdowns in even the basic use of the autoclave and a number of things that reflected what they found at the outpatient surgery center. So first we'll go to Frank, then back to Don, and then to you, Greg, regarding uh, you know, this issue of the outpatient flowing through uh, our systems, and now we've really got to gear up in, these, in the outpatient and in the procedure labs. Frank, your reflections on our conversations without using names, and then to sure. Don and then to Greg. Well, certainly, and I must commend our two speakers because they highlighted some of the, the key issues that we need to really start emphasizing in these outpatient environments from what we heard on, on, in CDC, obviously, there was a, this JAMA paper that was published in 2009 that addressed a little bit of what Chuck was uh, touching on, which is around single use of medication, reprocessing of devices, uh, using certain tests, point of care test devices without following uh, the, the typical infection prevention protocols. And as we keep kind of drilling down into this area, uh, obviously, the data aren't there, but clearly when you see uh, celebrated events that are 
coming into the press and the media spotlight, uh, we know that we're facing a potential challenge. And I think um, what we're seeing, and I think some work has been done in Europe about what infections that are potentially taking place in those environments and presenting themselves uh, uh, to the uh, acute care facilities as, as presence on admissions. But if we were to track back to where they came from, we actually as a, an organization might be responsible for them. So there is definitely something that we need to do in that space. And uh, one of the areas, and love to ha have our two speakers address that, is how do you level uh, the quality across the organization as you're acquiring? But even once you do have that merger completed, how do you make sure in these geographically uh, dispersed environments, you keep the same level of quality of care, the same level of protocols, and uh, assure that the, the, the level of quality of care is the same both in the, in, in the acute as well as the, in the outpatient environment. So I'd love to hear both uh, our speakers comment on that. Great. Well framed. Don. Yeah, no, I think that's a great, a great challenge. We have um, some of the things that we've done uh, from that perspective is one, we have, uh, we have an infection control and prevention uh, council that has uh, most of the, the professional staff uh, across the healthcare system uh, get together and they committed to themselves to, uh, to spend time uh, actually with site visits of all of the, um, any newly acquired uh, um, organizations or sites. And um, I think the, uh, uh, the kinds of findings that uh, you've mentioned, Frank, are, are things that certainly uh, we found some of the same problems where, uh, again, there was uh, seemed to be a complacency around uh, rigorous uh, approaches to um, appropriate prevention activities, and, uh, and I, those folks, um, you know, really uh, generated uh, reports. Uh, there was necessary action plans on the part of those groups, but at least as important, I think, ultimately was some of the work that had to do with uh, figuring out the culture of those groups to some degree. And so when we have our uh, patient safety culture and, uh, or I should say, attitudes and practices survey, uh, we can identify uh, differences in terms of uh, the way the staff feel, uh, either their resources, that they have the information they need, or that leaders uh, uh, have a, a, the right approach to dealing with event management. And so um, that has been an al also a, a good source of us to, to find hot spots, if you will, to, to focus some administrative activity on. Great, and, and so I'm going to come to you, and it's a little unfair to ask you, Greg, to address this issue of the outpatient environment, so I'm going to put a, a tighter spin on it. We've had uh, recent conversations with some very sophisticated technology developers uh, who have um, uh, developed the ability to uh, track individual caregivers, patients, devices within four inches. Uh, so they are using RFID and a number of uh, IT systems to really track people through acute care environments. And uh, what we're finding is just absolutely shocking in that um, if you look at hand hygiene uh, and you look at the, the, you know, when we're catching people doing the right thing versus the wrong thing, that hand hygiene drops off dramatically when the inspectors leave the floor and that uh, during shift changes, hand hygiene goes down uh, at night. Uh, it drops dramatically even if the patient load is not high. And so we're learning a lot about behave, what's called behavioral economics and the, uh, the economics of choice and the economics of your own time, not dollars, but just making choices. And you, to quote uh, uh, Warren Buffett, uh, the chains of habit are too light to be felt until they're too heavy to break. Um, this issue of adherence to policies uh, I know you all have been really focusing on improvement. Maybe to put a spin on it, you do, you, some of your outpatient work is bringing acute care patients in, but just re, perhaps react to the outpatient, but then also the adherence to some of these policies, because we've got new data now that's showing that a lot of what we thought we were measuring just is not there, and there are huge breakdowns in prevention of infection. Well, Chuck, I do have to acknowledge that my expertise in outpatient care is is very lacking, but. I will um, uh, say that, that my um, 
my strongest feeling about that is that the transitions in care are the most underappreciated uh, aspect of the care spectrum for for many patients. And uh, most of us that are hospital-based um, have really little appreciation for what happens in the outpatient arena and in the extended care arena. But I think that we can uh, both share methodology and tools for uh, measuring performance and following performance over time that could be used uh, in that arena as well. The important thing is to arm the troops there so that they can discover how to do it best in their environment. It really doesn't work well when an inpatient person tells the outpatient people how to do it. I, I don't have any street credibility there. One example from critical care that could be uh, a model for that circumstance, though, is uh, we have had in the last 10 or 15 years the uh, growth of EICUs where uh, large uh, numbers of ICUs don't have resources to have an intensivist in-house overnight, uh, but they've invested in telemedicine capability to have oversight of laboratory studies, physiologic variables, and other things that are ongoing data streams for patients that um, one or two clinicians can cover a large number of patients in a number of facilities and have an early warning role to identify patients who are at risk of deterioration or at risk for complication and, and alert the staff at that uh, particular unit to, to intervene early and, and give advice on what things to do even though they may not have the person with the, with the uh, board certification in critical care, they have enough uh, knowledge and skill to be able to intervene when it's identified. And that may be a model that could be used you know, in, in that arena to take data that's being followed about patients in the outpatient arena and have an early warning system that is being uh, watched in some way to identify people so they don't come into the hospital in, in dire straits, but maybe you have an opportunity to intervene earlier in, in, their, uh, in, their, in their healthcare. Well, great. Uh, so I just want to draw everyone's attention uh, to our polling uh, questions in the lower right-hand corner at, uh, of, the, uh, of your screen before we wrap up with our questions. And the first one is, I'm interested in a webinar regarding the new safety risks associated with mergers and expanding networks. And when, I say new, when we say new, we mean they're new to us. We're really realizing that there are perhaps risks that have been there for a long time. We just have not had the awareness that they have existed. And we're finding that a lot of our, our, our test bed are very interested because now they've got new accountabilities as we bring uh, organizations into our narrow networks. The second question is, I am responsible for patient safety areas in outpatient care. We need to know if you are because that helps us fine tune our webinar and know whether we invite folks to a separate webinar on outpatient care and whether pure inpatient care providers are just not interested. So I'd like to tease that out. The third question is, my organization is actively involved in developing, con developing or contracting with an ACO. You may have an ACO or you may be in active contracting with an ACO or even risk share agreements that have nothing to do with ACOs but are risk share agreements. Again, we wanted to keep the question short, but the issue is, is that as the risk sharing agreements are moving forward, we have to pay for all these um, adverse events now. and so profit centers of the past become cost centers of the future, but we want to know how many of you are actually actively involved in those. And then number four, uh, the fourth question is, I am interested in a webinar on communicating the business case for my organization of investing in patient safety, safety services or products. Uh, you've heard um, from two speakers, both addressing the critical importance of training, one uh, reflecting a, a, a book that they have written uh, that really lays out how they've undertaken their challenges. If you'd like to have a webinar specifically on how to make the case for helping develop such programs in your organization, we want to know about that as well. And then our fifth question, which is probably the most important, is in future web webinars, I would like to have the following topics covered. Here's your chance to give us the list of high priority topics that you want us to cover next year, and uh, we will do our very best to kind of, kind of meet those needs. Uh, I'd like to come back to uh, to uh, you uh, or to you, Don, um, because uh, of the we've got about seven minutes left. Uh, now that you've heard what we've discussed today, is there a message that you would like to generate or or, or spread? to our patient safety, quality, and C-suite leaders that are out there that, that you'd like to have them at least take away from this dialogue uh, today? 
Uh, I'm sure I'd be glad to. I think it's, um, I, I think in some respects having um, started with just me and, uh, and one other person, the development of, of a patient safety program and moving from patient safety as a theory to patient safety as um, a practice in evolution in an organization that most people know about um, happens over time, and it's it's an it's an evolution and and not a revolution. And so I, I think the the things I try to uh, leave with others is that uh, it's important to always be patient centered and to be uh, advocating for what would be uh, right for the care of a family member, um, and to be passionate about that and. Uh, but also, in the course of this, uh, everybody comes to work trying to do a good job, and so being polite, uh, even though one and, and persistent. And so those are a series of P's that I use, if you will, to, uh, to say it's important to work hard on this, but to always to be uh, patient in the evolution of this, but never letting down your energy level uh, to be achieving what patients deserve. And, and Greg. <clears throat> You know, building on the dialogue today, you know, one major takeaway message you you would love to have this audience, this kind of diverse audience that we have to take away. Well, I'm a I'm a clinician educator at heart, and I think that my burning issue is educating and arming the bedside uh, uh, clinician or the office clinician or whatever the environment is uh, to be able to be strong participants uh, in generating the data and. Uh, and delivering the care that's the safest, most effective, and patient-centered um, as we can. I'll come back now to, to Jenny. And Jenny, we're going to give you the last word, not now, but we'll loop back through each one of our speakers in the next three minutes. But I'd like to have you a reactor, giving you a chance to kind of react to what you've been hearing. This isn't your close, but just your reaction to what you've been hearing as a reactor. Well, thanks, Dr. Denham. Um, I think it's really, really important for patients and families to be engaged and be partners in their own health care. And I'm just really grateful to both of our speakers today for including the patient and family and engaging them. But most of all, thank you so much for your vigilance in trying to reduce medical harm and in, induce, and in, induce med, uh, patient safety in your facilities. You're great leaders, and I just want to thank you very much for doing that. Um, I'll hand it back to you, Dr. Denham. So, so that being said, and that, that there was kind of an intention there to get uh, Jenny in as a reactor, uh, can you, Don, and then to, to Greg, how are you incorporating patients, patient stories, inviting them to come in and be speakers to the environment? Because in our December webinar, we're going to be addressing SpeakerLink, which is our free matching system. It's kind of a match.com to get um, speakers in, in your hospital's communities to be available to those of you that are leading quality and safety. Can you tell us two things, uh, Don? One is how are you bringing them in and what's your advice to other safety and quality leaders that haven't brought patients and families in? I'll, then I'll go to, uh, to Greg and then, uh, Frank, I'll give you the final 10-second uh, word. So to uh, Don first. Uh, I, we have had a couple of approaches. One is that uh, we have uh, uh, lay individuals uh, from the community uh, participate in each of our patient safety committees. And I think uh, it uh, has changed the conversation around many things which might be things like sort of acceptable complication rates. Uh, don't Those are not things you can really um, talk about so simply when there is someone um, who's a non-professional there representing the community. Uh, I think that's very important. I think the second part of what you suggested is using stories uh, of uh, where things have not gone well uh, to make them personal, uh, meaning that rather than referring to a case, you refer to people who have, uh, who have suffered uh, at the hands of our system and to uh, and to try to do that in ways that uh, I think frame up the opportunity and the importance of our work. Great, Don, and I and I'm just going to take one indulge me just a, a little bit. Can you tell us formally? Do you have a regular 
formal structure with patient representation like Dana-Farber would and other organizations where there are um, specific people that are on committees who serve and provide a routine and regular and formal input? Yes, I, our, our, our program is probably not as, uh, as far reaching as, as what the Farber has done, but uh, we have, um, in fact, a, um, a fairly large cadre of these individuals that we seek out in order to place in committees and to uh, work on projects to provide input to uh, new clinic or uh, design uh, and, and those sorts of things. So uh, we, we really were moved by the Farber's um, thoughtful approach and, and so we've tried to do at least some of that. Great. Greg. Uh, formal Absolutely. structures. Do you have a formal structure for patients and families? Well, we have a huge uh, cancer survivor network, and almost all of our volunteers, which is a very large number, are former patients, uh, and they are very much uh, a part of the fabric of the work that we do. We have them involved in the ICU. Uh, we try to use their stories as the basis for discussion with our trainees and with our teams to ground what we're doing into the effect that it's having on patients. And uh, any chance we get to involve uh, family members in processes, we welcome that. Great, great. So Frank, I'll give you the last word. You've, you, we've been working intensively on this outpatient environment, and we'll give you the last word, and then we'll wrap up. Frank, your reaction. Oh, well, I, I get the last word. I, I just want to commend both of our speakers. I mean, one of the things I think we we always go back to his leadership and leadership engagement. Every time we've, uh, at least Dr. Kenley sharing with us, the board's uh, direct engagement, making this a charter, and not only in a, an abstraction, but also providing the resources and the funding to make that happen. So as we look uh, at our facing problems, we've got to remember it's leadership at the very top that can drive this and buying into it, not only at the front line, but providing the financial incentives are going to be critical. So commending both of you all for doing a, a great job in, in doing this. Great. So this uh, will close. Now we know a lot of you use uh, our, our program as a continuing education and are moving on to take care of patients and lead organizations. Uh, uh, Jenny, we'd like to thank you so much for pr always providing an inspiring approach to things and, and helping us ground ourselves in patients. And Greg, to your great work, and we look forward to working with you more intensively on the maintenance of certification and, and performance improvement projects. Don, great success uh, for you in the, uh, this merger and in your book. Uh, I have it. Uh, I think it's an excellent book, and uh, I've been buying it and giving it to uh, leadership teams. And Frank, thanks for your input. So God bless everybody, and we'll, we'll uh, uh, see you in, uh, have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and we'll see you in December. We'll be addressing uh, the speaker link uh, uh, approach, and we'll have a very uh, specific clinical area for patient safety and quality officers so that if that isn't uh, an area where you have great interest, we'll have something very clinical and very specific to core patient safety areas so we make sure everybody is fed. Uh, God bless, and we'll, we'll talk to you uh, in December.